Good morning, everyone, here at Church of the Valley. Good morning to all of you who are watching us on Facebook Live. Um, it's a wonderful, beautiful, uh, enjoy the weather, because I hear later this week it's going to be not this cool. And, yes, Tuesday through, and next weekend, even if it's 100 degrees, we promise to have this nice and cool for you to, uh, to come in. They have a lot of people, they don't have to worry. We'll make sure that this is, is nice for, for everyone. I don't think it'll be 100 degrees by 1030, so we'll be fine. Today, as we continue through worship, uh, we're going to be looking at mercy and what that looks like, the, the theme of mercy as people of faith, and why it's important, and what it looks like, and all of the different aspects of mercy. So, uh, as, as you're able, please stand, and we're going to sing together a song about mercy. There's a whiteness in God's mercy.
21 and 40. So it's a very liberal ish. So if you just like want to drop by, we'll we'll come in. And we'll we'll have some pizza, have some drinks. You don't have to drink, but you can. It'll be fun. We'll talk about Jesus. We'll talk about Jesus Christ, and we'll have some pizza crust. It'll be great. <laughs> the life of the church. Is there anyone here for the first time this morning? Francis, you have a friend? Hi. Would you mind telling us your name? And you know Francis. Francis is my sister, and I'm her big sister, Ruth. Welcome, Ruth. We're happy to be here. We're going to be going to prayer. So if you have a prayer on your heart, uh, there are prayer cards located in the queues in front of you. Um, we also enjoy celebrations, joys, um, as well as the concerns, so that we can celebrate with one another uh, the, the wonderful things that happen in our lives. So uh, fill those out, and Rick Gower will be collecting those. And of course, as always, those of you who are watching on Facebook Live, you're invited to uh, post down below in the comment section your concerns and your joys so that we can celebrate and we can lift one another up as well. So um, if you have those concerns, Rick Gower will be collecting them as we, as we, yes, you will, as we, <laughs> as we are blessed with music. <laughs> Thank you. 
traveling mercies for your family as you head to Europe this week. You'll be worshiping next week, uh, next Sunday at St. George Basilica. In, where is it? Gozo. Gozo. Wow, that'll be wonderful. How long are you going to be there? Uh, we're in Gozo for just over the week and then in Britain for three days. Okay. We'll miss you. And I might as well announce this now. Um, uh, taking care of the prayer concerns will be Bob White. So if, um, if you have Bob White's contact number, if you need to have something on the prayer list midweek, if you don't have his contact, contact number, you can call the office and talk to Nadia or let me know as well. For three weeks. Oh, two weeks. Two weeks. Derek Kevin, uh, Karen. Uh, for Tim Glover. Tim to heal his body from pain and sickness. James and Jerry Taylor to heal them both from sickness. And I pray for family and friends. And I like the last little one you stuck at the end. Um, bless me to win the lottery. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's big right now. It's really big. You know, if, if you were going to ask for the prayer, you should have asked for both. It's over a billion. <laughs> <laughs> Might as well. Linda Kearns asked for, uh, for, is it Jan or John? John. John, John having surgery for uh, uh, esophageal. Esophageal, thank you. esophageal cancer this week. Oh, so much cancer going. Carolyn, for Lauren Fisher, uh, my nephew and his surgery, he's home and recovering, uh, has been having some tough days. John Luke, for Clay, Clay's younger sister was hit by a car and passed at the beginning of June. He went to be with the family in Arizona uh, a few weeks ago, and we haven't heard from him since. I don't know where he is. Prayers that he finds his way home safely. Donna Hurst, by the way, that was amazing. <laughs> um, please pray for Linda Wendy. Um, she's having a, a cervical <coughs> vert vertebral surgery. Yeah, really difficult. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry. And Lance, brother David and his wife Sherry, whose brother passed last week and whose mother is preparing to be called home to the Lord. Does anyone else have any concerns they'd like to just lift up in the room? Yes. Hey, Tyler. Um, I have one. So, uh, first off, my uncle, uh, he has, he's been having cancer for a long time, and as of the last few months, I went out to my parents. For the first time, we visited, and he seemed all perky and stuff. But then a few weeks later, we visited him again, and he looked, he acted so weak.
our church family. Yes, amen. Captain? Is this your last Sunday with us? Um, Francis, you have been a part of this community for, and I, you know, you always will be, but we're not going to get to see your face as, as much. Maybe you can see our faces if you turn on your Facebook Live. But um, I remember, how long have you been here? It's got to be 30 years, isn't it? 40. 40 years. Um, so you know, I remember way back in the 80s and just, all, all, you know, all the things, all doing so much. <laughs> and I had big care of it too. <laughs> but I just want to let you know that you have been such an important part of this community for so long, and you will continue to be an important part of the community. Um, whether you're here in this room or whether you're, uh, where are you moving? San Antonio, Texas. Okay. Well, we've got people all over. You can come to Bible study. On Zoom. We've got people all over, literally the world coming to Bible study, and so you can continue to be. Um, but I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart, my heart on, on behalf of the church. So, so everything you've done. And thank you for taking care of her. <laughs> anyway, I'm Kevin. Uh, I'm yeah, this weekend marks the anniversary of my dad's funeral. So uh, I've got to the end of what's been a very difficult year because there's no more firsts, which is a big thing for me. And uh, as I've said many, many times, I'd like to thank everybody in this church for all the smiles and hugs and the nice things they've said over the last year to help me through what's been a really tough year. Um, I'm very, very honored and proud to be a member of this church. Thank you. We are honored to have you as part of this church as well. Linda. Yeah, this is a praise report. I'm two days out of my boot camp. <laughs> and I'm having a little bit of a difficult time learning how to walk again um, because one leg is now shorter than the other. But at least I'm out of the boot. <laughs> and what is the prognosis? What is the doctor saying? I'm going to see him again in a couple weeks. Okay. I'll let you know. All right. Anyone else? Donna? Prayers for our, our Christian friends at the Fellowship Christian Church. Yes. And this is the church that uh, they had three crosses in front of their church and someone lived on my fire. And it's just so hateful. So hateful. Thank you. Nadia? Um, my niece, Melanie, is having a bit of a hard time readjusting going back to Hawaii. Mm -hmm. She just really misses her grandma, and my mom misses her as well, pretty yeah. deeply. And it's just really hard for them because they're both very, very close to each other. So just prayers for Melanie as she gets used to being back in Hawaii and away from us because it's, it's just really hard. For Which is a, just a good excuse to go to Hawaii. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's when they're here, it doesn't feel like they were ever gone, doesn't it? I mean, they're here, and it's, it, I just hear Claudia's voice, and I... Oh, hey, Claudia. I'm like, oh, wait, I haven't seen you for months. You know? Yeah. Just such a part of this church. I kind of a praise report. There was a mass shooting today. He mm -hmm. shot, only was able to shoot one person, and they got him, and that person just has minor injuries. Oh, okay. I thought it was amazing. I would thank you, Lord. Yeah, it's just almost every day. Well, it is. It's average. On the average, it's more than every day. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? Thanks. Slightly bigger praise report, thankfully. I was blessed to be involved yesterday in ministering to about 3,000 brothers and sisters in faith who were baptized at the Corona uh, Del Mar Beach State Park yesterday. It was a blessing. <laughs> yes, he did the community meditation at 8 and told us the whole, the whole story, and it was it's pretty amazing. Anyone else? I had a bit of bronchitis earlier this week, so I'm, I'm uh, struggling with my voice. So I want to save my voice for the sermon. So Herb, could you make? Would, would you mind making your way to the microphone and praying? If you're, if you are more comfortable remaining in your seats, please do so. But if you would like to come forward as Herb offers us the prayer, I invite you to do that as well.
Gracious God, we are so happy that there is so much going on in the world that is positive. We see these signs that all is not hopeless, and for this we are grateful. But we also see there is much that needs to be done. We see there's a lot of heartache, a lot of things that people are going through, issues relating to health, issues relating to loss, and the fact that there is much harm that still exists. We pray that your spirit will move among all of us, that you will provide us comfort when we hurt, and that you will provide us strength that we may carry out your work in this world. A special blessing on our sister Frances as she <coughs> goes on a new adventure in her life. We pray that we may carry on the good work here that she has shown us through these many years as you help her to go on with that great work in Texas. As we think about our family and friends, help us to nurture them and help us to be the ones that they can rely on when they need us. And, Lord, help us to realize there are many who help us in this world and to be grateful for all the tiny things that happen to us each and every day that lift us up. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Silly, but I've been having kind of a lonely weekend. Uh, my wife Kim uh, took Adam, our son, to visit uh, his cousins this weekend. Actually, they left starting on Thursday, and I had to work on Thursday and Friday. So, needless to say, I've been bashing it up at home. So, I had a house party. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. <laughs> uh, actually, I had a lot planned for the weekend. I was going to do home fixer uppers, I was going to do yard work, I was going to try to do some writing. And I did some of that, but you know what happened. I got sucked into the couch and into TV movies as soon as I sat down. The first movie that I happened to turn on was Forgetting Sarah Marshall, uh, which I was telling a couple people about, which just, there's not a not funny scene in that. And uh, I mean, it, you know, without too much spoilers, you know, it's been out for years, so you guys should notice that. But it features <laughs> Dracula the Musical with puppets. And I'm sorry, right? <laughs> And it also features probably one of the best punchlines, which I, I can't tell you, but it involves the state fish of Hawaii, which is the humu humu nuku nuku a pua. So anyway, then after that, <laughs> there was another feature I got sucked into, Bridesmaids, which another amazing movie where it just doesn't matter where you join it. I mean, it's, it's amazing scenes, and it features probably one of the most satisfying accents I've ever heard uh, with the traffic cop. Second only, of course, to Kevin Blue. Yeah. Uh, so that was the lonely part of the week, and actually that was kind of entertaining sort of watching that, but uh, it was when I sat down for meals. Um, <laughs> sitting down at the table was just kind of empty. I mean, there's no one to talk to. It was just, you know, even at lunch, it was just me and my turkey sandwich. So uh, that's when you kind of hits you that it's uh, kind of hard to be alone with just your thoughts and it kind of reminded me of that, that sick feeling of being a kid when, you know, a school show or something is over and, and uh, it's just you again or, or, you know, what we call the Sunday scaries, kind of in anticipation of the new week. Uh, it also got me missing um, some of our big family gatherings. Uh, we had July 4th with our families, both Kim and I are families and it's you know, as we get older, it's just coming that realization that our families are shrinking and uh, we really have to enjoy every moment that we have. 
So, um, with that said, there is a table where we can come to where we're never alone, and that's this communion table. Each week, we're able to take the bread and the cup together in, remem in remembrance of the Last Supper and Jesus' commitment to us. Here, we can always be assured that God loves us and we have fellowship in our love for Christ. This love and community is always with us. And so we can never really be alone. We just have such a big family here. And all are welcome at this table. It's the tradition at our church to take the bread as it is passed. And then hold the cup to take together as a family. When they were all gathered in one place, after giving thanks, he took the bread and broke it and said, Take, eat, each of you, this is my body. Then he took the cup and said, This is the blood of the new covenant. Poured out for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Thank you, God, for this meal, this fellowship time, when we are not alone. We know that you will be with us as we retake this meal and as we dedicate ourselves to being your servants in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. Will the servants come forward, please?
But sometimes when I'm out walking on the street and someone comes up and asks me for a dollar, I'm a little bit concerned that they aren't going to spend that dollar wisely. Uh, there's a lot of money I spend that's not too wise. And that's because Sometimes it's easier to be emotional when it comes to money rather than logical. And I think there's a lot of emotion in this room and in this church. So when you have a little extra money, I think why not give it to the church where it will definitely do some good and help out us become a bigger, a better and more active church. Thank you. Let us thank God for all the gifts that we will receive today. Most holy God, we do give thanks for the gifts that we receive that allow us to continue to do your work. Um, let us see beyond the horizons that we've set for ourselves, even farther to places that we have yet to explore, so that we can find even more people who can be touched uh, by the work that is empowered in us through your Son, Jesus Christ. We ask for a blessing on the hands that provide these gifts, and it's in your Son's name we pray. Amen. Now take a moment and greet one another, and then when you hear the band start to play, you know the drill, go back to your seats.
And we have a new addition to the praise band, Paul Shesson, is joining us. <laughs> and also, I noticed that two uh, new first time people slipped in since we introduced people. So I think one, or one's right back there. Tatiana, oh, go ahead and stand up and introduce yourself. <laughs> We're glad you're here. And I believe somebody else right back there, correct? <laughs> Danielle. Welcome. And I'm going to give you a little uh, like a gift for being here. We, we don't like to say visitors because that means that you're not coming back. We like to say first time. <laughs> Katie, Katie said nobody sneaks in here. <laughs> the scripture reading today is from Matthew. It's Matthew 12, verses 1 through 8. At that time, Jesus went through the cornfields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. When the Pharisees saw, that, saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. He said to them, Have you not read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence which it was not lawful for him or his companions to eat, but only for the priests. Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple break the Sabbath and yet are guiltless? I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. But if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Amen. I read an article this week about a woman named Rochelle Friedman. And Rochelle was a very happy woman, especially at this time, because she was just a few days from marrying the man that she loved very much and had been with for very many, a lot of years. So she and her friends gathered uh, to celebrate together through a fun bachelorette party. Uh, the party was a very big success. Everyone was having a great time. Each of Rochelle's besties were there, uh, and they were all able to make it. And the fact that they were all together in one place once again just really added to the excitement of the evening. Well, late into the night, someone suggested that they all take a midnight swim out in the pool. And uh, the fun continued. They just made their way out and the fun continued out by the pool. Some were swimming, some were hanging out by the side just talking to one another. And at one point, Rochelle, who had been sitting by the pool, uh, wanted to speak to a friend who at that time was swimming. And when she did, she, she, when she made her way to the friend, um, uh, another friend thought that she would have some fun with Michelle. And so as Michelle approached the edge of the pool, this friend playfully pushed Michelle into the water. And this made all of the people at the, at, the, at the party cheer and laugh at the prank. But what the joking friend didn't consider was how shallow the pool was at that point. And Michelle didn't come up and she needed to be pulled out of the pool. She had hit her head on the bottom and she had broken her neck. And this caused Rochelle to be paralyzed from the neck down. Now, although Rochelle remained paralyzed for life, that she was able to marry her fiance one year later. But the most remarkable part of the story is that Rochelle held no grudge against the friend who had pushed her into the pool. She decided to forgive her and continue to love her. Rochelle said that she, in the past herself, had, you know, jokingly pushed people into the pool at pool parties. And Rochelle was able to accept what had happened, and she looked at it as no one's fault, and she saw it as an accident. What, was she, what Rochelle was offering to her friend was mercy. In today's scripture story, we find Christ pointing out the importance of the practice. In today's scripture story, we find Christ pointing out the importance of showing mercy. As Jesus and his disciples walk through the grain field, the disciples are hungry and they pick uh, uh, heads of grain. It's important that we remember that this incident takes place on the Sabbath because there are many special rules that are applied to the Sabbath. This is why the Pharisees get so upset. The Pharisees are the rule makers, or at least they are the ones that interpret the rules. And simply plucking grain uh, was regarded as harvesting, which was considered to be work. And so the work was not allowed during the Sabbath. The Pharisees noticed the disciples picking the grain, and the Pharisees, as they do uh, often in the Gospels, they confront them. 
And Jesus reminds them of the story of David who was, was hungry and entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, even though it was unlawful. The lesson that Christ is teaching in this story is that the Sabbath was created to enhance human beings' relationship with God. He's saying that humans, uh, human need must take precedence over the rules of the Sabbath. Christ suggests that the Pharisees simply don't understand mercy. Today's story really is one of mercy. This is a story that says mercy supersedes rules. God's laws are above all other laws. And God's laws, God places God's uh, mercy right at the top of God's laws. Now in today's world, being the wonderful Christians we are, even being as wonderful as we are, mercy isn't always easy. Part of the definition of mercy is compassion shown especially to an offender. Well, if it's compassion, then that makes us merciful. We can do that, right? We can do that. Compassion is sympathy for the suffering of others, but it also includes the desire to help. We can do that too. You know, there are those of us who are gathered to, today are darn good at that. When we see someone suffering, we suffer right along with them. When we see someone suffering, we really want to help. We're compassionate. Compassion is the basis for many of our, all, if not all of our ministries in this church. We see those in need of help. We see suffering. We seek ways of helping. We help. We're compassionate, I hope. But mercy contains another element. Mercy is compassion shown to an offender. And that's not always easy. That's why I said at the beginning the story about Michelle was one of mercy. When we feel that someone has wronged us, it may not be easy to show compassion. Whether it's someone who's just cut us off in the car next to us, or someone who's broken a confidence, or a friend who's hurt us. So when we find, our, find it in ourselves to show compassion when we've been wronged, we're being merciful, right? Not necessarily. Maybe, uh, but the truth is there are times when we're simply just being forgiving. And forgiveness is a part of mercy, but it's only a part. The final part of the definition of mercy is this. We've already got compassion shown, especially to an offender. But here's the final part. Over whom you have power. Over whom you have power. This is why mercy is so often associated with God, because God is the one that has power over us all. So mercy is something that we show as someone over whom we have power. And of course, there are numbers of varied examples of how we have power over someone. There's financial power. There's social status, job title, uh, physical strength, the list goes on and on. But then there are other areas that we find our power that we might not even think of. For instance, think of the power that you have over those who love you. I mean, think of the power that your feelings have over those who love you. Uh, it matters to me how those whom I love feel about me feel about what I say, feel about what I do. They have power over me. You all have power over me. When someone we love is angry with us, it usually changes us, at least for a while. We'll do anything to make that right. Have you ever had someone that you love tell you that they're not angry with you? They're just disappointed. Oh, my mom used to do that one to me when I was a kid. I think I, you, you know, I was rather, I'd rather she be angry. When a loved one is disappointed in us, it can knock the wind right out of us. It can alter us. So, what is it that we desperately need from that person, from someone who has power over us, who is angry or, or is disappointed in us? Is it forgiveness? No, what we need is their mercy. You know, remember, mercy is not forgiveness alone. It's compassion from someone who has the power over us. Compassion that understands how we feel, how we've been altered. That's what we need. And therefore, that's what we should provide to those who desire mercy from us. When we're in a position of power to show mercy, we must find the forgiveness. We must find the compassion, and we must show mercy. But why should we show mercy? Why is it important? Is it simply because it'll make them feel better, or it'll make us feel better? Or is it because we've been called to do so? It's because we've been called to do so. Christ has called us to be merciful. Mercy is a Christ-like act, and we've been called to practice it. Now, there's someone else over whom we each have power. Someone over whom we have more power 
than anyone else. And probably because of that very reason, we probably find it more difficult to show mercy to this person. And that person is ourselves. Like the rules that the Pharisees are so aware of, we've developed a set of rules for ourselves. And we, like the Pharisees, can be equally insistent that the rules be followed. If I'm going to feel good about myself, I have to get this new job. How about if I say something stupid, I'm going to embarrass myself. Or if I accidentally say or do something that hurts someone's feelings, I should be ashamed of myself. Of course, the list goes on. Those feelings come from our childhood, our early adulthood, our workplace, our society. But the truth is, we all know that if we don't get that job, we can still feel good about ourselves. If we say something stupid, who hasn't? And if we accidentally say or do something that hurts someone's feelings, a heartfelt, I am so sorry, goes a long way. But we still hold our personal rules to a higher standard. We are more likely to have mercy on someone else than we are on ourselves. But we are called to have mercy on others. I believe we are equally called to have mercy on ourselves. But often we don't want to release ourselves from these laws that we've created. Sometimes it's so hard to forgive ourselves for breaking our rules. We need to practice more kindness towards ourselves. Let's, keep, let's stop comparing ourselves to others. Let's make our mistakes opportunities for growth and allow ourselves to be patient with our growth. Let's have the courage and the boldness. It takes courage and boldness to be merciful to ourselves and to others. To show mercy, we must believe in ourselves and we must believe in others. To show mercy, we must have value in ourselves and in others. When we're being merciful, we are seeing the possibility in others, and we're seeing the possibility in ourselves. We are seeing God in others, and we're seeing God in ourselves. When Jesus showed mercy to others, he did so because he could see their potential. Jesus showed mercy as an example for us to follow, and he did so because he saw our potential to be Christ-like. God has created us perfectly imperfect, but with the capability to provide mercy, with the capability to look at others and to look at ourselves and look past imperfections, to look beyond the rules created by ourselves and created by society and to see ourselves and to see others as God's perfect children, sometimes stumbling, sometimes falling, but always worthy of forgiveness, always worthy of compassion, always worthy of grace, and always deserving of mercy. Amen. Can you pray with me? Merciful God, we come to you once again as works in progress. Help us to always see ourselves and to always see one another as you see us. Help us to always treat ourselves and to always treat one another as you treat us. May your grace, your forgiveness, your compassion, and your mercy be to each of us an ongoing example of how we should live our lives. And may we all, and all that we do, be a reflection of your love. Be with those who have gathered here today, keep us safe and healthy, and we'll return to this place next time. It's in your son's most holy name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Michael. Please stand if you're able and sing along to this amazing song, Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone.
being here today. Um, I'm gonna stay around and, and uh, out by the coffee and donuts and and, and have a, a you know chat with someone that maybe you haven't seen in a while. And uh, don't forget to see Kevin if you if you need to get your tickets for Macbeth. And I, all I can say is go out and be merciful. You know, go out and spread mercy as mercy has been shown to you by God already in each and every day. Um, Tyler, I, I, it was, I, I hope that message spoke to you because that's exactly what, what I was trying to say to you early. God is mercy like we can't even imagine. And so, and thank God for that because every one of us has needed it and called on it at one time. So let's go out and return the favor and, and supply it for someone else. Love you all. See you soon. Thank <laughs> you.